Hello ladies and gents and welcome back to the second video of the World Builder Wiki video series with me Monolithic Bacon. In this second step we'll be continuing where we left off looking over how to create your first map and the map sizes to choose. Within this we'll also consider the overlay menu and how best to look around your map. Before we jump into specifics however we should bear in mind that maps and their sizes will always change based on the amount of players involved. Two player maps should always be the smallest, while eight player maps are usually the largest. But there's plenty of freedom between sizes. For example, a lot of stock maps within Company of Heroes 2 will cater to two players and four players together, and therefore will be slightly larger than two player maps. For a complete list of all the ideal map sizes, however, check out the written tutorial, which is linked below. But where we'll be taking off is with our two-player map, which last time we called Two-Player Flood. When we last left off, we were looking at the world builder just as we were beginning to create a new file. Now what I've done here is already opened up the new window and you'll notice that it says Save As. I can go back to show you this process again. If we go on to File and Create New Multiplayer Map, the Save As window pops up because this is actually the process for beginning to save. However, it's worth noting that when you actually create this file and hit save, it doesn't actually save anything. So if I scroll down to Two Player Flood, which was the folder we created before, and you type in the name, usually you have to make sure that the name of the file is the same as the folder. Now I already have a file here called Two Player Flood, because I'm a little bit further in the tutorial, but again, like I said, this won't actually save, so I might as well just use the exact same name and hit save anyway. This is the most important step, however, which is the new scenario window. You may find that the more experienced you become with a world builder, the longer and longer you will spend working with this first and opening step before actually going too far into a map. The size has to be perfect for what you want. Now, the sizes that you'll see immediately on the blank terrain are not really worth taking much notice of. The sizes here are all in meters, and the playable area here, 64 by 64 meters, is far too small. To give you an impression of a map which is normally for two players such as Arnhem Checkpoint, the playable area on that map is actually 352 meters by 352, which far exceeds what is automatically on here, so assume that this is worthless. Now to begin with, the terrain size, this first window up here, these are the maximum coordinates for the entire canvas. Now, a lot of the terrain size will be well out of your scope. Chances are that within the terrain size, you will only see perhaps two thirds of it. Because the terrain size includes the playable area itself, the soft map edge where units and reinforcements will arrive from, and the out of bounds beyond that. So this terrain size includes everything and therefore has to be the largest. And if you have a look at the playable area, I won't be able to go any further beyond the actual terrain size, which is built in. Now, let's say we go with the example of Arnhem Checkpoint to begin with. And again, if you want to go on to the links below to follow the wiki, you'll see several different sizes for different examples of maps. But since we're working with a two player map in this example, let's go for the basics. Now, the terrain size on Arnhem Checkpoint is actually 672 meters by 672. It's a nice square. But the playable area, as I said before, is only 352. Now that practically means that we've got a very, very large area, 320 meters beyond the playable area, which is not actually going to be seen by players. It's just going to be out of bounds assets like trees and hills that you won't really get a look at but it makes a map look a little bit more realistic if you happen to rotate your camera down to have a look beyond the outer bounds. Now the cell size here is something that you can't change. Well, it seems like you can, but you really shouldn't. It doesn't really benefit you at all. But this new part here, this starting position, has only been in for maybe a year now, and it's extremely useful. I would highly recommend you use it. There is no point in not using it. Because what this does, by clicking Generate Starting Positions, is spawns all of the assets you need to save your map instantly. With this in mind, it provides the territory flag for HQ areas, it provides the HQ markers themselves, and it provides map entry points. 
All those three assets can be found and can be placed yourself if you don't want to check that option. But in all honesty, you're saving yourself maybe 5 or 10 minutes, maybe even longer than that if you don't know where to look. Also, you can spawn 2, 4, 6 and 8 players. So these amounts of bases and map entry points will all spawn as soon as you hit OK. Now, because again, it's a two-player map, let's just go for two. Now, once you hit OK, you'll notice that the screen should go black, and this is very, very normal. Some computers will take a little while, but it depends entirely on your system. And this window that's popped up here is simply because I've had the World Builder open almost all day. So I'm going to hit no for this because it's just reminding me to save. Now, you can actually set the interval yourself, but that's something to look at a little bit later. Anyways, this map is what we are met with straight away. It doesn't really look like much, just a bland texture. And probably the most important thing to get us started is learning how to look around the map itself. If you are used to playing games like Company of Heroes 2, you should know the controls by now, and these shouldn't really be any different. The arrow keys themselves will move the camera up, down, back and forth. The scroll wheel on your mouse will zoom out. You can also click the scroll wheel in to move around rapidly if you really want to. And then the other camera controls include holding Alt, which will allow you to pan the camera up and down to get a bird's eye view or to get a bit of a landscape view if necessary. And of course, just as before, if you hit backspace, your camera should reset to the previous angle. And if you hit it twice, it will go to the previous zoom. Now, if we go back to the zoomed out position, this is where I'd recommend you spend the vast majority of your time planning your map. You can't really do it up close, but you'll notice there's a haze that's come all over the screen, which is actually fog. If you can see where my mouse is at the top here, there's a button to turn the fog on and off, and for now, I'd recommend turning it off, because it clears everything for you. Now, this is where the overlay comes in. The overlay up here on your taskbar allows you to change what you can actually see in front of you to aid your planning massively. The first thing I'd recommend is if you go on to overlay and go to toggle show playable area. Once you click it, you should see a very thin red line which should start to appear. And this is essentially the boundary between the playable area that you chose and where the outer bounds begins. In game, this red line signifies the very, very edge that players can reach. Now, what I would always plan to have anyway is another border within this, which we will create in a moment, where units will spawn in from. So this red line here will actually show the area of the, the map, the size of the map, and I will probably make it even smaller than that. It might not look like very much, especially because these HQ markers are very large, but believe me, this is more than adequate for a two-player map. And even some four play maps will be about the same size as this. So nothing to worry about at the moment. Another thing to bear in mind as well is on the overlay, you should have access to the grid. Now this grid will come in 5, 10 and 32 meters. Bit of a weird choice. And 32 meters is the one I'd always recommend because we actually built our map in scales of 32 meters. Once you click that, you should have access to a nice looking grid, which is very, very visible in the early stages of planning, but will become a lot harder to use once you have things like tiles and textures involved. So it's worth using it in this early stage. This next step actually goes beyond the first basic tutorial that is on the written wiki. Now, the reason why I wanted to go one step beyond is because we can simply end the basic tutorial now by hitting the save button. When you hit save, it means that everything is currently working in your map. Now, because you have all these assets down here, so you have a flag for each team, you have the HQ marker, and you have the map entry points, that means that your map is not only playable, but is definitely savable. If you come across any issues with saving, whereas the world builder will not let you save, there are some issues usually with either these assets here, or other territory flags, and we'll come across those in another tutorial. But, since we are on this very first step, let's get this thing looking a bit more like an old map. So let's introduce you to the spline placement tool, which is up here on your taskbar. It looks kind of like a road with some yellow lines instead of white. 
Now, all of your tools within the World Builder will spawn on the right-hand side here. The Spline tool is one that we'll look at several times because it has different modes, Texture, Object, and Deform. And we will only use Texture to begin with. So click it anyway, just in case, because that will change the tool itself down here. And at the moment, my textures have appeared. When I normally plan a map myself, I would use a drawn plan. I will have a piece of paper in front of me, I'll scribble all over it. But you can do the same thing on the Will Builder itself. What we'll do is use a very particular set of splines, which will hopefully draw out our plan for us. And we'll start by scrolling down the list and finding the folder called NM Designer. Within NM Designer, you've got several things like narrow roads, which look like blank roads without any textures, just so you can get an impression of what the layout of your map will look like. But the one we really need is your soft map edge. Left click on that, and then left click on assign. Check at the top that it's been ticked, and that means that this is currently active and we can start placing splines. Now something to bear in mind is I will walk you through these steps, but if you have a look down here on the bottom left hand corner, it should say exactly how to use the basics of the tool. But for the sake of argument, let's go through a step by step of how to use splines. Now a spline itself will only work when you right click. What it will do is create nodes. You can usually have up to 10, sometimes maybe more than 10 nodes, but the idea is to keep them simple. The more nodes that you add, the more unstable the spline will become. And generally speaking, your splines always want to be working in a line from end to end. You can, if I create this and bear with me a second, if I create a spline that runs around in a circle like this, that should be absolutely fine. But what you don't want is a spline that goes back on itself in different shapes and crosses over. While that looks okay for now, with objects that can cause lots of issues. With the form, it will cause no end of problems. So wherever possible, avoid going back on yourself if you can. Anyways, I've missed a step in that once you've created your nodes that you want, usually you have to consider that four is the minimum. So with small sp splines, try to keep them very close to each other. Once you're happy with your placement, just hit the enter key on your keyboard, and then you can left click and drag it however you want. Additionally, if you hit the space bar, it should bring those nodes back up, and you can move and manipulate them however you want. This allows you to play around a little bit so you can fit splines into your map itself. And usually if you're creating things like roadways later on in the map, you can just create a very simple spline, move it over to where you want it, and then shape it and bend it around the map itself. Anyways, you'll notice that I've built this first spline from end to end, so from the edge of the playable area to the other end, and I've built it 64 meters in. That's on purpose, because some maps, not all, but some maps, will have a 64 meter soft map edge. Now, what we'll want to do is create this edge all the way around the map, but there's no point in creating another spline if we can help it. This one is perfectly straight. So left click the spline itself, hold the C key on your keyboard, and then left click and drag, and you'll create a nice copy. When you've moved it to where you want, you should have something that resembles the exact same. And now we can get even cheekier. Let's make this so much easier. If you left click and drag to create a box over the two splines, you can select both of them together. Or if you left click one, hold shift and left click the other, you can select more than one together. And this is useful when you have multiple splines you want to move at the same time. But as before, with both of these selected, hold the C key, click and drag to move them apart, and then we'll try and rotate them on the spot. So without going into the nodes at all, we can move the splines and rotate them pretty easily. Hold the shift key, and then left click and drag again, and we can start rotating them. Now this is where you'll start encountering problems if you're using a laptop rather than a desktop mouse. Laptops and the touchpads will usually have some issues with the accuracy of this. I've tried it for many, many years, back before I actually had a PC, and believe me, it's tough. 
and even springing out for a little USB mouse can easily make a difference. Either way, once you've got these two splines rotated, just move them together and line them up so that you've got a perfect 64 meter border all the way around the entire map. This red line indicates where the edge of the playable area is. That's essentially the soft map edge. And in game, your camera will not actually be able to go any further past this red line. So players will be confined to this space, which looks even smaller than before. But, again, don't worry about the size for now. As long as you have stuck with the, the same size that we picked to begin with, you should be able to fit everything in. Now the last step for this tutorial is to get the assets, like the HQ markers, moved slightly out of the way. So let's do that now. If you go over to the object placement tool, which is just up here, it looks like a man and a tree, potentially holding a balloon. Left click on that, and it will start loading up. Now mine loaded up pretty fast, but in all honesty, that is the tool that usually takes the longest to spawn in. For now, we don't actually have to worry about anything that's on this list. We don't even need to worry about going into any menus. All we want is the ability to move assets. Now, with splines, just as it is with assets, if you left click on one, you can move it around. But if you hold a box over them, you can move several objects. And again, as before, if you hold shift, you can select multiple ones and deselect them as you wish. Now, because these HQ markers represent where our teams will spawn, we don't want them spawning here. They're going to spawn right next to each other, and it's going to go very messy very quick. So let's click and drag over one team and move them into a corner. And let's click and drag the other team and move them into the opposite corner. Now, the last step for this is just getting this all ready for territory. What I will do is rotate my HQ marker so that it's facing inwards. Now this is a bit of a difficult one to grasp, but the idea is these prongs that stick out are always the left hand side of the HQ itself. And this, this funnel here represents the front. That's the same with all teams. I'm going to place that in the center of a 64 by 64 meter grid so that there's plenty of room to maneuver around it. The flag can stay where it is, but I'm also going to move this map entry point to the outside 32 meters out of the playable area. And I can also rotate it around so that it's facing inwards. Boop, like that. This means that when my camera is focused in game, as it will be about here, and I can't move any further, units will not actually spawn in my field of view. They will walk into my field of view, spawning from here and walking to here. If I do the same thing with the other team, again, I will make sure that these prongs are on their left-hand side and that this funnel here is the entrance way, so that they are essentially looking straight at each other. And I will move the map entry point, which is thankfully already pointed in the right direction, 32 meters out. If you think that this flag is going to be in the way, don't worry. When the game actually starts and the map is spawned, this is an invisible asset. It will not actually do anything in-game. All it does is create territory, which is what we'll look at in the next step. Once you're happy, however, hit save. And as long as you've got no errors, we should be absolutely good to go. Now, one last thing is that while this video series will continue covering the basics of mapping, please remember that the majority of support can be found on the written guides. The wiki itself is a, an absolutely massive, comprehensive list of everything that you can do, going from the very basics up to steps of mastery. So these videos are only here to get you on your feet, and after the first few tutorials, they will only be there for little snippets, just where there's a little bit of extra help or a little bit of extra detail required. Either way, I hope this has helped you so far, and I look forward to seeing you in part three.